As I was growing up, I viewed religion basically as a series of hoops that I thought I had to jump through to try and make God be happy enough with me that he wouldn't throw me into the lake of fire when I died. And so during the week, I'd, like almost everybody else, just live doing whatever seemed right to me and trying to have as much fun as I could. And then as the end of the week came near, I'd kind of do a little bit of mental accounting and say, okay, how many, how many prayers do I need to pray? How many candles do I need to light? Do I need to go to church this week to kind of offset the fun that I've been having? Now, as I look back, although I can say that I genuinely believed that with my heart at the time, what that demonstrates is that my heart just simply wasn't right towards the Lord. And I did not delight to do what God wanted me to do. In fact, I delighted to do what I wanted to do and then was just hoping that I could jump through just enough hoops that I could avoid any kind of eternal punishment when I died. This is how many people view religion still. and. What we see in Psalm chapter 40 helps us not only to expose that this is an error in our own heart, but it also helps to expose the glorious fulfillment of what Christ was doing when he came not to abolish the old covenant, but to fulfill it because the heart of the old covenant and the heart of the new covenant were still the same. And so if we want to understand the heart of God, we need to understand what King David was revealing in Psalm chapter 40 and how Christ fulfilled this glorious truth. I know a lot of Christians still don't really understand the relationship between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And Psalm chapter 40, which is quoted in the book of Hebrews, particularly in Hebrews chapter 10, helps us to understand how the New Covenant is simply the fulfillment of and the continuation of the same heart that was expressed in the Old Covenant. Now, it is true that the stipulations are different, different, that the new covenant is built on better promises, that it has a better mediator, that it is a new and everlasting covenant, that the old was the shadow and the, the new is the substance. And yet we see that the intention and the heart were still the same. King David wrote Psalm chapter 40 about a thousand years before Jesus was born. And as the king of Israel, he was certainly familiar with the old covenant law. He understood the law of Moses, he understood the sacrificial system, he understood the, uh, the, the festivals that they had to keep and all of those things. And yet he says something that is easy to misunderstand in Psalm chapter 40, which the author of Hebrews helps us to understand more directly. While I would encourage you to read all of Psalm 40 on your own, we're just going to focus on that part which is quoted in the New Covenant. In Psalm chapter 40, King David wrote this, Sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I come, in the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. It is easy to misunderstand what King David is expressing. Certainly he's not undermining the Mosaic system and saying that the requirements of the law are no longer required. But what David is saying is that because God has opened his ears to understand what the true intention of the law is, that the God of the nation of Israel is not like the God or gods of the surrounding nations, which are also being worshipped with similar sounding uh, sacrificial requirements. And some of the surrounding nations, as people would make sacrifices to their god or gods, they were hoping to appease the gods and to gain favor because the gods did delight in those sacrifices. As they offered them milk or wheat, as they offered them the blood of animals or even the blood of human beings, they were desiring to gain the approval of God so that God would then bless them in whatever it is that they wanted to do. They wanted a safe voyage, for example. They would offer uh, something to the God of the sea to hopefully gain the favor of the God by offering the sacrifices so that then the God would give them safe passage. And these superstitious ideas were prevalent in the surrounding cultures. But what David understands as the king of the nation of Israel is that while there might be some similarities in the law, the God of Israel did not delight in the blood of bulls and goats. He didn't delight in the offering of the wheat and the salt and everything else, but he delighted in what the fulfillment of these things would be because these were a shadow pointing to the substance. David wasn't trying to gain the favor of God, but instead he was praising God because God had freely bestowed his favor upon them. And then he gave them this system to point to the ultimate substance which would be fulfilled later in the person of the Messiah. 
What we get wrong when we think that religion is a series of hoops is we think of this works-based thing where I'm going to try and jump through enough hoops to gain God's favor so that I can continue to delight to do my own will and that God will bless me in that task. That's not what the Bible describes. Instead, what the Bible describes is that those who are called out of darkness into the light of God, that by his grace our heart is changed and we no longer delight to live in our own way, in our own unrighteousness, doing those things which are displeasing to God, but now our heart truly delights to do his will. David is described as a man after God's own heart. And I can honestly assess my own heart and say that when I was younger, although I truly believed I was gaining God's favor by lighting the candles and saying the prayers and going to the church that I went to, I can also just as honestly say that my heart wasn't really in it. I did all the jumping through the hoops simply because I didn't want to be penalized at the end of my life, not because I truly rejoiced in righteousness. Now, as someone who is born again by the grace and spirit of God, I see that God is not holding out on me, but that he has, in fact, put his law on my heart. And I agree in my spirit that his ways are better than my ways. And so I rejoice knowing that his will is good and that he's not holding out on me. That's evidence of the grace of God in my life. And I hope that it's evident in your life. When we see the author of Hebrews then quote this, what he's saying is that he understood the same thing that David understood, that the true heart of the old covenant and the true heart of the new covenant was not that we would appease God, but that we would continually magnify God who was pleased to offer his son as the fulfillment of these things so that we could be accepted into his sight and so that the true thing which could take away our sins, not the blood of bulls and goats, but the blood of his beloved son, that then we could be received into his presence because Jesus perfectly fulfilled the will of God when you and I have not. You see, I couldn't die for my own sins, let alone for yours or for anyone else's. Bulls and goats, we could never kill enough and shed enough blood to cover over the sins of anyone. They could never take away sin. But what they can do is provide a daily reminder of the seriousness of sin because unlike our perfect Savior, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And while that thought should fill us with dread, what David understood under the old covenant by the grace of God and what we should understand under the new covenant by the grace of God is that the heart of God was not that we would jump through hoops to please him, but that because of his great love, he would do all of the hoop jumping, so to speak, by sending his son to perfectly fulfill the righteous requirements of the law, to fulfill it, not to abolish it, and then to lay down his life so that his blood could be shed for the true forgiveness of our sins. Then we can rejoice and magnify him as we delight to do his will. And part of his will is that we would believe upon the Son, no longer being unbelieving, but believing, and that then we would magnify him in the world and proclaim the glad tidings of his salvation in all the earth. You see, when I wanted to jump through those hoops, I wasn't all that interested in talking about God or magnifying Him. I just kind of wanted to do that on its own. And if somebody asked me, hey, do you go to church? I wouldn't, I wouldn't lie about it or hide it, but it wasn't on my mind to talk about those things. Whereas now that my heart has been changed, it's on my mind to talk about those things because I want to continually magnify the Lord just like David did because I am so thankful that God did all of the heavy lifting because I could have never ever jumped through enough hoops to gain his approval. The old covenant and the new covenant had the same heart to point us to the sacrifice of Christ, the true substance. And so when the author of Hebrews quotes this, he speaks of Jesus being the true fulfillment of David's sentiment, that the one whom the book wrote about was in fact the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, who came to perfectly fulfill the will of God and then to lay down his life so that his blood could be shed for the forgiveness of the sins of all who would trust in him. Likewise, as the book of Hebrews continues, it goes on at the end of Hebrews chapter 10 to warn of continuing in that mindset of thinking that we can appease God by living however we want, willfully sinning against him, but gritting our teeth and saying, oh, we'll just offer the sacrifices. The Bible warns that this is nothing that pleases God. In fact, this is a dead system and it leads only to judgment. 
Even though I believed in my heart that I was a good kid and that I was doing the right thing by avoiding the list of really bad, naughty things that God told me not to do, even though they seemed fun, and then kind of doing the things that maybe other people weren't doing by going to church more than just on Christmas and Easter and saying my prayers most days, these things, they were going to lead to death because in my heart, I did not delight to do the will of God and I was trying to cover over my wickedness with my own works. Our heart really does help us to see whether or not we're truly in the faith. And so while I can't answer this for you, I can at least direct you to look to your heart and not say, do you believe what you, what you say you believe? Everybody w would say, oh yeah, who are you to question what I believe? But to ask a different heart-related question, do you delight to do the will of God? When you open up the Bible and read it and see that God delights in righteousness and that he abhors unrighteousness, do you agree with God in your spirit or do you just kind of grit your teeth and go, Ugh, I don't know about this. I'm just going to kind of do the things I think that I need to do. I'll make sure I pray and I'll make sure I go to church and I'll make sure I give some money to these ministries and then you know, I, I, I still want to do what's right in my own eyes then that heart exposure should show us that we're not really in line with the heart of the Old Covenant or the New Covenant, that we've deviated from what God has told us to do and that we're not delighting in doing His will and believing upon His Son and trusting in Him, but we're really delighting in doing our own will and hoping that God will be pleased with whatever sacrifices we offer. Psalm chapter 40 helps us to see that Christ is the fulfillment of the law, that He is the fulfillment of what all of these things were ultimately pointing to. Jesus is the substance. And as we delight to do the will of God, we will delight to magnify Christ in the world, to lift Him up, and to praise Him as we think about the salvation that He so freely offered because there aren't enough hoops in the world for us to jump through that we could ever do it on our own. Are you praising God today through Christ our Lord? Are you beholding the glory of God in the face of Christ? And are you magnifying Him in the world because only He is able to save? Get equipped. Obey your King. Glorify your God.